Hello there, you're Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining me today for Stay Free with Russell Brand. Hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving and I hope you are ready to give praise and thanks for a brilliant and educational conversation with Dr. Robert Redfield. Dr. Robert Redfield was one of Fauci's colleagues and acolytes who came out and spoke publicly against Fauci. He believes that there is potentially a risk of a new bird flu pandemic, not just, excuse me, because of a hunch he's got, but because of extraordinary ongoing gain of function research around bird flu. He also brilliantly exposed that Fauci's attitude to what gain of function actually means is part of the kind of generalized deception that we experienced during the pandemic period, i.e. they don't believe that it's gain of function research if you change a mammal or bird or you know ornithological uh, virus into a human one only if you start with a human one and all of that. It's a really interesting and fascinating conversation and it's brilliant to get insights from someone who knows how the system works. If you're watching us on YouTube, get over to Rumble and if you're not an Awake and Wonder yet, become one because then you'll be able to see things like this, my amazing conversation with Jonathan Pajot. I love this moment. There's a whole slew of texts, we call them the Enochian texts, the Enochian tradition that discuss how before the flood, the humans, um, you know, made partnerships with these entities, these demons, and these demons taught them all these skills. And the skills brought about corruption, and that these skills brought about brought about a kind of arrogance, this kind of pride that, that brought about the end of the world. So the end of the world before the, the flood was caused by this, this human's, um, making some kind of deals with demons and then receiving te technical skills and creating, uh, you know, creating a society that fell apart. Okay, without any more nonsense, let's get into my conversation with Dr. Robert Redfield, virologist, former director at the CDC, medic and scientist who understands at depth what went on during the pandemic, both politically and medically. You're going to enjoy this conversation. Thank you so much, Robert Redfield, for joining us on Stay Free. It's such a pleasure to see you, sir. Good to see you, Russell. We encountered one another briefly in a conversation with Bobby Kennedy and a group of people that were talking, uh, it seemed primarily about addiction. They were going to talk, have hopefully a, a wide ranging conversation about the influence of, of Big Pharma on American health policy and the impact, therefore, of Big Pharma on uh, the American population. Firstly, I reckon I'd love to go in with a bold question. Given you your former position and authority, given the ascent of Bobby Kennedy and other com not comparable figures, but affiliated figures, uh, uh, assuming that there is confirmation for Jay Bhattacharya, Marty Makari et al. Um, do you think that in 12 months time, people might say that the measures taken by the American government when it came to the COVID pandemic actually did more harm than good when it comes to vaccines, lockdowns, masks, public division, impact on people who are receiving treatment from anything from diabetes to cancer to heart conditions. Like still, when people talk about it in legacy media, they are almost dying to say, yeah, but millions of lives, this is someone like Bill Maher, but millions of lives were saved by the vaccine. How do you think, you know, uh, not history will regard the decisions that were made during the pandemic, but, you know, the very near future in 12 months with the kind of information that's likely to be exposed, the kind of studies that are likely to be undertaken if Jay Bhattacharya becomes the head of the NIH and the sort of general shift in the conversation now that the legacy media no longer has the stranglehold it once did. You know, uh, Russell, I think there, I think it'd be an honest uh, uh, review of uh, the policies and and looking at them from a bi-directional point of view that there uh, were some policies that have benefit, but there were some policies that actually were not of benefit to public health. You mentioned some of them. The mandating of vaccines was not in the public health interest. The closing of the schools was not in the public health interest of K through 12s. The closing of business uh, to the degree that occurred was not in the interest of society. So I think uh, I think there'll be an honest uh, understanding, um, sort of an over heavy handedness of some of these government policies. It should have been more open, honest debate about them uh, prior to their implementation. I think the vaccine, 
a warp speeds vaccine was uh, an important uh, accomplishment that really was driven by President Trump. I mean, he's really the reason why it happened. Uh, and it did, in fact, uh, save some lives of those of us that are highly vulnerable, over 65, for example. But I don't think it was prudent to mandate the vaccine, particularly for those individuals that were not at high risk for bad outcome, those of us under 50, for example. So hopefully there'll be an honest uh, uh, review. I know myself as a CDC director, I'm very open about acknowledging the mistakes that were made. I think the closing of uh, industry, the closing of the schools, uh, the over heavy handed mandating uh, uh, vaccine, these were all significant public health mistakes. Wow. Do you think that so like, we'll come to say that maybe closing schools was a mistake? Do you think we'll come to say that vaccinating kids was a mistake unless they had sort of serious comorbidities? Do you think that we'll come to regard that as a mistake? Yeah, I think the clear, um, the, the idea of how the vaccine should have been deployed, it should have really been prioritized for high risk individuals, particularly those over the age of 65. And as you mentioned, uh, maybe younger individuals if they had very significant medical conditions. I'm not in favor of the current uh, CDC recommendation that has now recommended uh, the COVID vaccine for children down to the age of six months. I don't see the purpose of it. The vaccine does not prevent infection. It prevents serious illness. Uh, and hospitalization and death. And all of those are not something that people that are under the age of 50 are really at any subsequent risk for. So I think uh, there should be more rigorous debate about this, but uh, I think uh, the broad use of the vaccine in the general population to me was, was not indicated. If you heard, like I have, Doctor, that potentially some studies that have been undertaken but are unlikely to be published indicate that with significant sample sizes, maybe up to 12,000 kids, there's an indication that children that were vaccinated have a significantly higher risk of a bunch of behavioral and heart and respiratory conditions than uh, the, the non-vaccinated group of a study that could be uh, two groups, one size 2,000, one 10,000 that is being withheld right now. I wonder if you've heard about that study. Russell, I haven't seen those studies. I have seen some data that, of course, uh, some of the mRNA vaccines were associated, for example, with myocarditis, pericarditis in adolescents. I do think it's important um, that uh, there's transparency about the safety profiles of these vaccines and people that do have data, uh, it should be made available to, uh, for the public to review. Um, no vaccine is 100% safe. There clearly are some significant side effects from the mRNA vaccines. And uh, I think that data should be put in the public domain so it can be critically reviewed. But I haven't seen the data you're referring to. Yeah, I suppose that's it. Uh, one of the things that I've recently started to consider is safety and, you know, how, what, what the conditions, what the clinical conditions are that determine safety, i.e. was it just that there were some checks on 100 kids five days later, or is it, you know, thousands of kids years later? And obviously in the case of like COVID vaccines, we don't have the time frame to even consider that and due to the nature of operation warp speed and whatever motivated it to be undertaken at that speed i suppose legitimately the fact is that it was an unfolding crisis that there was some obligation to respond to in one way or another but i think like probably in 2024 those of us that didn't get any vaccines at all and regarded the entire exercise with skepticism aren't looking back thinking I wish I'd gotten vaccinated, even if we had like, you know, I did COVID two or three times and, you know, and by and large did my best to obey uh, regulations that I strongly disagreed with. Um, do you think that sort of anecdotal and personal response is relatively fair, doctor? Well, I think it's going to be uh, obviously critical to look at that mostly, um, again, I come back to the, the COVID vaccines in particular, they really were never approved because they prevented infection. So first people have to realize it's not a typical vaccine. It doesn't prevent infection. The vaccines were approved because they prevented serious illness, hospitalization, and death. And therefore, if you're not at risk 
for serious illness, hospitalization, and death. You can argue that the vaccine may not be something that you should focus on for yourself. And I think this is where there were mistakes that there was sort of this blanket view that, you know, let's vaccinate everybody. There should have been much more focus on vaccination of the vulnerable. The other thing I'll say about the vaccine that's really important is that the current COVID vaccines, um, they're non-durable. That means like when you take a vaccine like for polio or measles, that vaccine will provide long-term protect protection one year after another, 10 years, so maybe longer. When you take the COVID vaccine, there's probably only a four to six month period where you're adequately immunized and protection from that vaccine. So someone like myself that unfortunately is over the age of 65, I'm 73, I have a little type 2 diabetes, I have hypertension, I'm slightly overweight, although I'm trying to get that under control. So you could say that I have risk factors for a bad outcome. And so I can tell you now, I've been now, I've received my ninth uh, COVID vaccine. Now, I don't use the mRNA vaccine. I like the killed protein vaccine. I think it's a smarter vaccine to use. But I do think this is all going to be revisited. And sadly, I think the public health communities lost you know, a lot of credibility and a lot of trust because of some of these recommendations, which I think when they're critically re-reviewed, um, they're not based on science. Even though people said they were based on science, they really weren't based on science. They were based on an opinion that somehow certain people believed uh, having this vaccine was better than not having it. And again, I think for highly vulnerable people, it, it really made a difference. So older people in nursing homes. Um, uh, but then again, the caveat is not just to be vaccinated, but to be adequately vaccinated. When I was the senior public health advisor for, for Governor Hogan in the state of Maryland after I left CDC, one of the things that I noticed uh, right away was we had increased mortality and hospitalization in our nursing homes. And so the state of Maryland very rapidly uh, when the vaccine got approved in December, between December and January, we pretty much vaccinated all of our nursing home individuals. And we saw uh, immediately a reduction in the hospitalization and death from COVID. But around, around April, May, I started to see more and more reports of nursing home uh, residents being reported in hospitalization and death. And so I said, well, well wait a minute, maybe this vaccine's not durable. And we went in and evaluated the immunity of a number of individuals in the nursing homes to see if they had durable response. And we found out that two thirds of them no longer had a measurable response. So the fact that this vaccine is not durable is also something that's not been adequately addressed. This is not a vaccine. If you do need it to protect yourself against serious illness and hospitalization, this is not an annual vaccine. This is a vaccine you probably need two to three times a year to stay adequately vaccinated if you're going to use it to try to prevent serious hospitalization death. So I, I don't think the public health community has really uh, pulled out and articulated this vaccine properly. And as a consequence, it's added to a lot of distrust, I think, about the role of the vaccine in general. We can't continue this on YouTube because it's about to get exciting. We're about to start talking about the next pandemic, virology, the manipulations, the actual signatures in microbiology that make it pretty clear that this must have happened in a laboratory. It's an amazing conversation. We also talk about the ethics of the pharmaceutical industry when pertaining to the opioid crisis. It's an amazing conversation. You will come out of it feeling a lot better. Anthony Fauci will not. Click the link in the description. Get on over to Rumble. Let's get back to Dr. Robert Redfield.